Hello everyone and welcome to this historic stay at home fall weekend. It is wonderful to be here and to extend my warmest greetings to all you alumni, parents and family who make up the Great Khan community. I'm speaking to you from Temple Green where in the past I might have greeted you during lunch or at a soccer game or perusing the stalls inside our Harvest Fest tent. COVID-19 has of course made all that impossible this year. So we're doing the next best thing, finding new ways to share our camel spirit with you, starting with that beautiful fall convocation on Thursday. I wanna spend some time today reflecting on that spirit because I think it may be the best way to characterize the current state of our college. And what a state we are in. In our entire 100 year history, we have never known a year like this one. In the fall of 1918, Connecticut College experienced the Spanish flu pandemic. In 1930, the Great Depression. In 1968, urgent calls for racial justice. But this fall, in 2020, we are facing all three at once, and it's transforming everything we do. Yes, it has been challenging, but through it all, a basic truth has emerged, one that illuminates both our history and our current moment. It can be summed up in three words. Camels carry on. All those things the camel is known for, intelligence, patience, constancy, and resilience, I have seen again and again this year as I have witnessed our wonderful staff, faculty, students, and alumni turn a bad situation into something good. Camels are fighters. Camels go the extra mile. Camels never, ever give up. And when I tell you everything that has happened over the past several months, I think you'll see what I mean. Let me begin with the wonderful class of 2024. These intrepid students were destined to be camels, having pushed through a senior year upended by a pandemic. We gave them until June to make their college decision, and we're glad we did. We ended up enrolling an extremely vibrant class, one of the most diverse and talented in our history, the vast majority of whom saw Connecticut College as their first choice. Many of them told us that Connections, our innovative approach to the liberal arts, was the main reason they chose Khan. While the students were deciding, we were hard at work reimagining a fall semester like no other. By July, we had entered into a new partnership with Hartford Healthcare, the most comprehensive healthcare organization in the state, to oversee all our medical services. By August, we had transformed the hockey rink into our very own COVID-19 testing center. With support from the Broad Institute, we were soon testing everyone in residence twice per week. As of today, we have completed nearly 20,000 tests of students, faculty, and staff. We also converted dining into a takeout operation, redesigned our cleaning protocols, created socially distanced classrooms, and added Adirondack chairs and tents for formal and informal teaching. Most important, we re-engineered our entire academic schedule into a flexible mix of in-person, remote, and hybrid courses every day of the week. When classes started September 1st, we had faculty, students, and staff on campus or working remotely from locations across the region, across the country, and across the world. A year ago, we would not have thought it possible, but right now, there are 375 students taking their courses from home, 175 in off-campus apartments are commuting, and 1,125 students living here. And for those on campus, our 750 acres are being used like never before, with students studying, doing team practices, taking dance classes, or just enjoying the great outdoors. By the way, those dancers on the green are first year students in a seminar taught by David Dorfman. Looking down the hill, they can see the biggest project taking place on campus, the renovation of Palmer Auditorium into the Athey Center for Performance and Research. Last year on fall weekend, we had a ceremonial groundbreaking this year, construction is in full swing. 
It is the first major upgrade since the building opened in 1939. Palmer is our wonderful Art Deco era theater, designed by the architect of the Empire State Building. The renovation preserves its historic character while introducing much needed improvements. A new theater classroom, seminar room, and two areas for collaboration and study, an office suite for theater faculty and staff, a new entry hall, and an elevator, making the building accessible for the first time in its history. The hall itself includes a new stage, new seating, lighting, and sound, and the return of original windows for natural light. Major gifts from Nancy Athey, class of 72, and Preston Athey, and the Sherman Fairchild Foundation made it all possible. Construction began as soon as the governor reopened the state for business. And with the current prohibition on large gatherings, it's the perfect time to have Palmer offline. We expect it to reopen in August 2021. This is a great example of con carrying on. Another example is our waterfront. Khan is the only NESCAC school located on the water. We love our great view of the sound, but we actually touch the Thames River. A century ago, this was the most prized aspect of the college landscape. Dense overgrowth has made it harder to appreciate in recent years. So our grounds crew took advantage of the empty campus last spring to do something about it. Through a huge effort, they reclaimed the hillside. The river is now a destination and a beautiful new way to enjoy the outdoors. Making our waterfront accessible is a goal of both our strategic plan and our action plan for athletics, unveiled last fall, that seeks to elevate the student-athlete experience by investing in coaching, recruitment, and facilities. The pandemic may have reduced NESCAC competition, but it has not reduced our commitment to these goals the second stage of the waterfront project is a new array of floating docks for sailing, rowing, and recreation, a project we hope to complete by next year. After Palmer, the next big project called for in our master plan is the revitalization of the College Center at Crozier Williams, or Crow. In February, before the pandemic turned life on its head, the Board of Trustees approved the new architectural concept for Crow an open floor plan with fireplaces, study areas, a cafe, a pub, and a large meeting room that doubles as a performance venue. Advancing our fundraising for this project is another major goal for this year. By offering opportunities for enhanced student engagement, the Crow Project also speaks to another priority, one that we sometimes call full participation. The vision of a residential community where all people can thrive reach their full potential, and contribute to the flourishing of others. Our 2016 strategic plan is built around that ideal. Our 2018 equity and inclusion action plan spells it out with greater depth. In the past months, it has become more urgent in the wake of the pandemic, the killing of George Floyd, and the global outcry for racial justice. To talk about the state of the college means discussing all these issues and how we are addressing them. Our guide star is the Dialogue Project. A year ago, I announced a gift from Agnes Gund, class of 1960, that would endow a new program on intergroup dialogue and anti-racist education. A vibrant democracy depends on citizens prepared to engage in dialogue about and across social differences. Citizens with greater reserves of empathy and resilience. Last year, the Gun Dialogue Project supported both a first-year seminar and a public lecture series bringing together the campus and the New London community in important conversations on race. The project trained dozens of student leaders in the art of facilitating difficult conversations, leaders who are now training their peers. The college also expanded its partnership with the Posse Foundation, bringing a new posse from New York City to join our long-standing posses from Chicago. Since August, we have held three summits on racial equity, attended by 400 students, faculty, and alumni. And our Dean of Institutional Equity and Inclusion, John McKnight, is leading an important task force convened by the Mayor of New London on police reform in the city. All this work is a reflection of our mission, 
of educating students to put the liberal arts into action, a mission that is beautifully realized through our new curriculum, Connections. A year ago at this time, we were planning the culminating event for the first cohort of students to go through Connections, our inaugural all-college symposium. Last November, seniors in the class of 2020 gave us the best they had. They showed how they had explored personally meaningful questions through pathways that combined courses, research, jobs, community work, and global experiences. It was a monumental day, as one senior commented, where we were able to reflect on our own paths and be inspired by the work of our peers. An equally inspiring set of panels, poster sessions, and performances is planned for our second all-college symposium on Friday, November 6th, to be held online this year. The point of connections, and the point of our mission, of course, is to enable students to achieve their dreams. So to close this report on the state of the college, I want to acknowledge some notable achievements of the last year. And let me start with faculty, who are models for student excellence. In the spring, our faculty showed great determination and skill as they shifted to the brave new world of remote teaching. But the disruption didn't slow their research. The prodigious Peter Siver, for example, professor of botany and environmental studies, just won $287,000 from the National Science Foundation to support his research tracing 80 million years of evolution in freshwater organisms. Mark Zimmer, professor of chemistry, brought out a new book, his sixth, called The State of Science, describing the rapid transformation of fields, research methods, and public trust in science. Carla Parker Athel, one of our newest assistant professors in biology, won a seed grant from the Sloan Scholars Mentoring Network to advance her research on cortisol exposure and the biological impact of trauma on child development. Mara Sutman Lee, assistant professor of government, won a highly competitive fellowship from the Social Science Research Council for her work on the use of social media in voter education. And Anna Valia, assistant professor of art history and architecture, received a fellowship at the University of Basel to complete her book on German modernist architects and the American welfare state. No wonder our students are inspired. And following the example, they have racked up their own awards. Some are on their way to graduate school, some will travel the world. In April, Jocelyn Navarro, class of 2019, won a prestigious National Science Foundation graduate fellowship to pursue her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Arizona. And Jamila Esbide, class of 2019, fresh from her internship at the UN, won a Gates Cambridge Fellowship to pursue studies in identity, diplomacy, and conflict resolution at the University of Cambridge this year. Continuing with international recognition, in July, two students won Gilman International Fellowships, Dariana Greer from the class of 21 to pursue Afro-Caribbean dance in Cuba, and Bella Sorrenti, class of 22, to conduct research in Rome. Several also won competitive fellowships to pursue language study. Grace Kovich, class of 21, won a Boron Fellowship to spend a summer in Beijing. Hilary Ton, class of 21, won both a Gilman Critical Need Fellowship and a Fund for Education Abroad Scholarship, awarded to just 2% of applicants to study Chinese. And Dashiell Hunter, class of 22, won a critical language scholarship from the U.S. State Department to study Arabic in Jordan. In February, Connecticut College was again named a top producer of Fulbrights, and by May, we had four more winners, Grace Berman, class of 18, and Megan Faragni, class of 20, to teach in Spain, Scott Brower to teach in Germany, and Sophia Angela Kuhn to teach in Austria. Not to mention the many stars we have among our alumni, let me mention just a couple of the most recent. Jasmine Hughes, class of 2012, who was on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list just a couple of years ago, was promoted this summer to story editor of the New York Times Magazine. And Chakina Sims, class of 2017, 
out of thousands of Posse alumni across the United States was chosen to receive the Ainsley Alumni Achievement Award from the Posse Foundation for her groundbreaking work as president of Chicago Votes. You call that inspiring? We just call it putting the liberal arts into action. So I think you can see, despite, or perhaps even because of the challenges we are facing, that Khan is carrying on with more determination than ever. And that, to be honest, has been the ethos of this college from the very beginning. I often think about that first year in 1915, where 17 faculty and 125 students gave all they had of brain and hand and heart, to use the words of the first president, Frederick Sykes, to build a new college where there once was none. Our faculty, students, and staff have done the same thing this year as they leverage new technologies to build a safe, more flexible, creative, and excellent experience for our current challenging moment. In the process, they too created new practices that will transform our future. None of this could have happened without your help, and so I want to close by saying thank you. I want to thank our wonderful Camel parents for supporting your students through this time of challenge, teaching the skills of resilience. I want to thank our amazing Camel alumni for stepping up to help our students in their time of greatest need and for your desire to make your alma mater always more beautiful, more just, and more excellent. Excellence is a continual striving for greater achievement and impact. So you are the embodiment of the excellence that Connecticut College has been committed to for the whole of its 100-year history. Let me thank all of you for helping us carry on with the great unfinished project of Connecticut College and for helping our students achieve their dreams. Happy fall weekend. I'd like to thank all the alumni who made it possible for us to come back because I'm so happy to be back at Connecticut College. Thank you to every professor who's made it possible for each student to have the right accommodations. I'd also like to thank each and every parent for supporting us on campus. I would like to say thank you to all of those who have supported the New York and Chicago Posse. Lastly, I would also like to say thank you to all of the professors who have changed the way they're teaching in order to give Connecticut College students a greater education through the midst of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for providing international students with a safe space to stay over the summer. And thanks for the faculty and staff for making it safe for students to return back to campus. Thank you to all the friends that I have made who have since graduated who helped me feel confident and comfortable in the Khan community. And especially thank you to the staff members who have made it possible for us to be on campus this fall. I'd like to thank the faculty and staff of Connecticut College to make it possible for me to even stand here during this semester and during the times that we're in. And I also want to thank the parents who trusted Connecticut College enough to let their children here and make it a more lively campus. And just in general, just wanted to finally thank President Catherine Bertrand, who worked with her team of faculty to make it possible for us to learn on campus this year and have all the activities this year. And I'm really thankful to even be here and learning in person in Connecticut College. I would like to thank our staff and our administration for all the effort that you have put into our return back to Khan. And I would also love to give a warm thank you to our parents and our alum. Your help affects our community greatly.